16. Mikako Pierce In early 2020, a 50-year-old Sydney woman named Mikako Pierce was left nearly unrecognizable following an attack by two men that occurred on her way to work. She had just $30 on her when the culprits brutally assaulted and robbed her at around 5 o'clock a.m. near a transit station that she used every day during her morning commute. The suspects beat Mikako with such force that she fell unconscious and didn't remember the attack when she came to. She managed to stumble 1,000 feet or 300 meters to her house where her horrified husband called the police. Disturbing surveillance footage of the attack showed the two men approaching Mikako from behind and punching her in the back of the head. She fell onto the ground and was left there as her attackers ran off with her backpack, which contained her phone and a small amount of cash. Following the assault, Mikako's husband Jeffrey told Nine News that his wife was so traumatized that she was afraid to return to work or even leave the house on her own. Before the incident, the couple thought Mikako was perfectly safe walking to the station on her way to work. They never expected that she'd walk through her front door covered in blood and with her face swollen almost beyond recognition. Police charged a 36-year-old man with aggravated assault in connection with the attack. But the attacker's name hasn't been released, and the outcome of the case is unclear. 15. Abby Dominski A 59-year-old Wisconsin man was on his way home from work in Waukesha County late one night in September 2017 when he saw a vehicle cross into his lane while traveling in the opposite direction. He attempted to veer out of its path but lost control of his own car and was struck by the oncoming vehicle. The man walked away with only minor injuries, but not everyone involved in the accident was as fortunate. Identified by police as 23-year-old Abby Dominski of Pewaukee, the out-of-control driver then slammed head-on into a vehicle being driven by 44-year-old Candice Frankoyak, who died from her injuries at the scene. Dominski allegedly told police that she didn't remember what had happened but initially claimed that she didn't have that much to drink while out at a bar earlier that evening with her boyfriend. She later blamed her boyfriend for letting her drive drunk, but the responsibility for her decisions ultimately fell on her. In December 2018, Dominski pleaded no contest to one count of homicide by intoxicated use of a vehicle. She was sentenced to six years in prison, followed by eight years of probation along with a requirement to return to jail on the anniversary of the accident every year until she fulfills her debt to society. To ensure that she would remember the devastation caused by her recklessness, the judge also ordered Dominski to keep a photo of Frank Hoyek with her while she served her time and to attend a victim impact panel. The young woman's sentence was substantially less than the 15 years she could have faced. And while she apologized to Frank Hoyak's family for her actions, it wasn't enough to eliminate the sting of what seemed to them like a far too lenient sentence for taking a human life. Several of the victim's loved ones walked out of the courtroom visibly upset by the judge's decision, which is understandable given the loss they'd suffered. Moving forward, one can only hope that Dominski gets her life on track and does everything possible to redeem herself and restore her standing as a respectable member of society. 14. Caitlin Kaufman 26-year-old Caitlin Kaufman didn't shy away from working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. While most Americans stayed safely at home, she bravely put her own safety on the line as an overnight nurse at Nashville's Ascension St. Thomas Hospital West. On what began as a normal evening in December 2020, the young woman was fatally shot during her drive to work. The shooter, later identified as 21-year-old Devonte Hill, fired at Caitlin six times in what he would later describe as an impulsive reaction to her cutting him off on the highway. According to police, the two had no prior history. They were complete strangers when the trigger-happy suspect decided to cope with his anger with an onslaught of bullets in the victim's direction. And sadly, 
One of the bullets entered Caitlin's body through her left shoulder, killing her almost instantly. Acting on a tip from the public, police recovered the murder weapon, which proved to be an exact match to the bullet casings found at the crime scene. They were able to further connect Hill to the crimes through cell phone data and other evidence. Hill was riding as a passenger in an SUV being driven by a man named James Cowan at the time of Caitlin's death. Both men were charged with murder, and Cohen was ultimately acquitted by a jury, while Hill was convicted of a reduced second-degree murder charge. At his sentencing, Hill apologized for the stupid behavior and irrational decision that led to Caitlin's death. The judge acknowledged his willingness to take responsibility for his actions, but questioned his sincerity while imposing the maximum sentence of 25 years in prison. 13. Tyler Stice When 20-year-old college student Tyler Stice failed to show up at his job in Kingman, Arizona on June 20, 2016, his concerned boss called his mother Stephanie and inquired about his whereabouts. Tyler had only been working at his job for about a month, but had proven to be reliable enough for a no-call no-show to seem out of character. But later that day, Tyler came home and told his mother that he'd skipped work because he had some things on his mind and needed time to think. The next morning, Tyler woke up and prepared his lunch as usual. He got into his beloved black Ford Mustang, pulled out of his driveway, and hasn't been seen or heard from since. For a second day in a row, he failed to show up at his job, and his cell phone was now going straight to voicemail, elevating his loved one's concern from worried to panicked. Left with no other options, Stephanie reported her son missing. Four days after Tyler vanished, his car was found abandoned along a remote road running through the Hualapai Mountains. Several of his personal belongings were missing, including his laptop, cell phone, keys, and wallet. Tyler's DNA was found on an iced tea can inside the vehicle, but investigators failed to uncover any evidence to suggest what may have happened to him or if foul play was involved. Police dogs tracked the young man's scent about a mile, or 1.6 kilometers, into the forest, but eventually they lost his trail. Shortly before his disappearance, Tyler bought a hunting rifle and ammunition, despite not being much of an outdoorsman. He was described by those who knew him as an avid gamer and a loner who kept to himself. Someone logged into one of Tyler's online accounts six months after he went missing. But just like every other clue that's fallen into detectives' hands, it failed to bring them any closer to solving the case. Nearly eight years after Tyler vanished into thin air, the case remains cold. Investigators don't know whether he disappeared on purpose or if he was perhaps met with foul play. It's also possible that he experienced a crisis that caused him to act out of character and end up in a dangerous situation. For now, law enforcement is hoping that someone comes forward with information that could help lead to his whereabouts and provide his family with long-awaited answers. 12. Gabriela Kosilko 26-year-old beautician Gabriela Kosilko vanished while on her way home from work late one night in August 2023. She was last seen shopping at a grocery store in Leicester, England at around 11.30 p.m. and was reported missing the next day when she failed to return home. Her car was found abandoned along a street the afternoon after her disappearance, amid a widespread search for the missing woman. In the meantime, police arrested a 30-year-old Polish national named Sebastian Zarnok on suspicion of kidnapping. The charge was upgraded to murder a few days later following the discovery of Gabriella's body in a wooded area. And later that day, Zarnok was found dead in his jail cell. Authorities believe that Gabriella and the suspect knew each other, but haven't yet revealed how Gabriella died or how they connected Zarnok to her murder. The investigation is ongoing, and law enforcement has appealed to the public for information regarding the case. In late 2023, an inquest into Zarnok's death was opened. While the findings have yet to be revealed, officials said that several jail employees were facing discipline for allowing the suspect's death to occur on their watch. 
when it was their job to ensure that something like this didn't happen. After all, by losing the suspect, investigators may have very well lost the only source who could provide them with definitive answers about the motive behind Gabriella's murder. 11. Nicholas Francisco 28-year-old Nicholas Francisco was expecting his third child with his wife and college sweetheart Christine when he vanished on his way home from work during the winter of 2008. At the time, he was working as an art director at an ad agency in Queen Anne, Washington. Things seemed to be going well until he never arrived home after promising his daughter he was on his way and would make cookies with her when he got there. Shortly after Nicholas went missing, Christine told the Seattle Post Intelligencer that her husband would never willingly disappear without telling her. Even if he needed some time and space to himself, he would let her know, but she turned out to be wrong. In reality, Nicholas went to elaborate lengths to slip quietly out of his existence outside suburban Seattle so he could start over elsewhere. He even went as far as to abandon his car outside an apartment building. Amid her desperate efforts to find out what had happened to her husband, Christine discovered secret bank accounts, emails, and other activity showing that Nicholas was very much alive and well. He'd been living a double life for most of his marriage and had been cruising the internet for dates and casual hookups under the username Funtime Steve. Nicholas was eventually tracked down in California, where he was living under the name Alex Martin, as if his family had never even existed. Meanwhile, Christine was left behind to raise their kids on her own. The family's home was foreclosed upon, and Christine also had to pick up the payments on his student loans to avoid having her own credit ravaged. Luckily though, she remarried and is doing well as an accomplished author. What Nicholas did to his family was rotten, but it apparently wasn't illegal. He was never charged with any crimes, although he was called out on social media for being a deadbeat husband and dad in ways that will most likely follow him around forever, which is satisfying in its own right. As of 2023, Nicholas had not had any contact with his two older children in over 15 years and had never met his youngest child. 10. Salvador Herrera 42-year-old bartender Salvador Herrera had just finished a Saturday night shift at a bar in Chicago and was driving home during the early morning hours in October of 2023 when he witnessed a group of people breaking into a car on the city's near west side. His good Samaritan instincts kicked in prompting him to pull over and intervene, even though he was outnumbered and putting himself directly in harm's way. Herrera was still in his car when he said something to the thieves, who shot him in the back and fled the scene. He was found an hour later and was rushed to a nearby hospital where he died from his injuries. When news of Herrera's murder broke, local resident Alex Markovic came forward and revealed that the thieves were trying to steal his car and that it was the second time his vehicle had been targeted while parked in the area. Markovic overheard the gunshots from inside his apartment, but was too scared to go outside and see what happened. He called on city officials to take a more heavy-handed approach to violent crime, saying that Herrera is owed an apology for the fact that he was killed while trying to do the right thing. Sadly, unlike many of Chicago's shootings, the case remains unsolved. A witness reported seeing four individuals fleeing the crime scene, but they remain at large. Both police and Herrera's family have appealed to the public for information or evidence that could bring the killers to justice, but unfortunately, they're still waiting for answers to their questions. 9. Leah Croucher 19-year-old Leah Croucher's family last saw her at home in the evening on Valentine's Day in 2019. The next morning, she left the residence in the English city of Milton Keynes for her job. However, she never arrived at work, prompting her loved ones to report her missing later that day. The last known surveillance footage of Leah showed her walking along a local street shortly after 8 a.m. 
three people reported seeing an upset young woman matching Leah's description in the hours after the clip was captured. But the information didn't bring detectives any closer to finding her. Leah's location remained a mystery for nearly three years, despite a reward being offered for information leading to her whereabouts. Acting on a tip in October 2022, police found Leah's body in the loft of a home less than a half mile, 0.8 kilometers from where she vanished, along with a backpack containing her personal belongings. Two days later, authorities identified a convicted predator named Neil Maxwell as the top suspect in Leah's murder. He'll unfortunately never be brought to justice because he was found dead two months after Leah disappeared. But hopefully it provided the community with some measure of comfort to know that he'll never harm another living soul. 8. David Schultz as a semi-truck driver, 53-year-old David Schultz spent the vast majority of his working time on the road, trekking from one destination to the next. The evening of November 20th, 2023 was no different. At around 7 p.m., Schultz left his home in Wall Lake, Iowa to pick up a load of live pigs in Eagle Grove. Records would later show that he reached his destination and left shortly before 11 p.m. He was then seen on surveillance footage heading west out of a truck stop at around 11.15 p.m. When Schultz's wife, Sarah, found out that he never reached the hog buying station in Sac City, where he was supposed to drop off the pigs, she reported him missing. The following afternoon, David's truck was found parked in the middle of the road at a rural intersection surrounded by cornfields. The vehicle was loaded with the pigs he picked up the night before, the key was in the ignition, and the lights were off. David's cell phone, wallet, and cash were inside the unlocked cab, and his coat was found in a nearby ditch on the opposite side of the road. But he himself was nowhere to be found and he hasn't been seen or heard from since. Extensive search efforts have failed to turn up any sign of the missing husband and father. Sarah Schultz is convinced that David was met with foul play. During an interview with the Sioux City Journal, she said that her husband wouldn't deliberately vanish and that he'd never abandon his family. She believes that the case is too much for a small town law enforcement agency to handle and wants the FBI to get involved. Sac County Sheriff Ken McClure was reluctant to speculate regarding what may have happened to David, but he told the journal that he's confident the case will get solved. About a month after David vanished, McClure said that his office was receiving several tips per day, and that they thoroughly vetted each and every piece of information that they received. He further explained that the FBI isn't currently involved because there's no evidence to suggest that a federal crime has been committed. However, he said that the agency may be asked to assist in the investigation at some point down the road. Meanwhile, Sarah has become so desperate for answers that she's consulted some psychics on the off chance that they might be able to point the search for David in the right direction. One of the psychics told Sarah that David was struck in the back of the head and was placed into a moving body of water. But as things currently stand, there's no actual evidence to suggest that this is the case. Speaking with the Sioux City Journal, Iowa-based truck driver Colin Gierstorf said that the case has a lot of people on edge. He said that a lot of weird stuff happens out on the road and that David's disappearance has caused worry among truckers' wives. For now, though, all anyone can do is wait and hope for answers to come in the form of tips or physical evidence. 7. Whitney Heichel On what began as an ordinary October morning in 2012, 21-year-old barista Whitney Heichel kissed her husband goodbye and headed to her 7 a.m. shift at a Starbucks cafe in Gresham, Oregon. Sadly, though, she was never seen alive again. Whitney's husband, Clint, reported her missing just a few hours later after learning from her supervisor that she'd failed to show up at her job. During the five-minute drive between her home and workplace, she had somehow ended up in what could only be a bad situation. Volunteers found the young woman's SUV abandoned in a Walmart parking lot while handing out flyers during their efforts to find Whitney. The passenger side window had been shattered, 
and bank records showed that Whitney's debit card had been used at two local gas stations on the day of her disappearance. Whitney's neighbor, 24-year-old Jonathan Holt, fell under suspicion when his stories about his activities on the day of the murder didn't add up. Under pressure from detectives, he confessed to murdering Whitney and led them to her body on Larch Mountain, roughly 40 minutes from where the young woman vanished. Sadly, she'd been shot several times. Holt and his wife lived in the same apartment building as the Haeckels. The couples were also devout Jehovah's Witnesses who attended the same Kingdom Hall. Nobody ever imagined that Holt was capable of killing, nor did they understand why anyone would choose to take the life of a kind young woman with no major enemies and a bright future ahead of her. Holt confessed to waiting for Whitney outside her apartment building and asking her for a ride a favor that she felt perfectly safe accommodating, given the fact that they knew each other. But a few minutes into the ride, Holt pulled a gun and ordered Whitney to drive to a remote lake, where he forced her to do unspeakable things, and then shot her in the head four times. During Holt's court proceedings, during Holt's court proceedings, member of the Haeckel family pointed out how his actions destroyed several families, including his own. While Jehovah's Witnesses don't typically defer to the legal system for justice, the courtroom was filled with congregation members who threw their full support behind Whitney's loved ones. In 2013, Holt pleaded guilty to aggravated murder, first-degree kidnapping, and first-degree robbery. He admitted that he was all the things people had called him during their victim impact statements. A coward, a liar, a thief, a pervert, and a cold-blooded killer and that he deserved whatever punishment he received. So, in the end, the judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole, ensuring that he'll spend the rest of his days behind bars. 6. Linda Razzle 41-year-old mother of four, Linda Razzle, left her home in the English town of Swindon for her job at a local college in 2002, and was never seen again, alive or otherwise. At the time, she was entangled in a bitter divorce against her estranged husband, Glenn Razzle, and was engaged to her new partner, Greg Worrell. Greg was alerted to Linda's disappearance when he found out that she'd failed to pick her kids up from school. Although Linda's body was never found, investigators concluded that Glenn murdered her. Roughly a week before she went missing, Linda had obtained a court order to freeze Glenn's financial accounts. Prosecutors would later argue that Glenn was unwilling to accept the inevitable divorce settlement that he knew he was facing. Glenn denied any involvement in Linda's disappearance and refused to lead law enforcement to her body, claiming that he had no way of knowing if she was even dead because he had nothing to do with her whereabouts. He was nevertheless convicted of Linda's murder and was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Glenn's repeated refusal to reveal the location of Linda's remains has earned him multiple parole denials under Helen's Law, which enables parole boards to deny freedom to killers who conceal their victims' whereabouts. The law was named after 22-year-old Helen McCourt, who vanished on her way home from work in February of 1988. Her accused killer, pub owner Ian Sims, was found guilty of her murder, despite her body never having been found. Sims maintained his innocence following his conviction and never revealed the location of Helen's body. In 2005, Glenn Razzle claimed that he could produce expert testimony that would disprove DNA evidence that was used to secure his conviction. But he never procured the proof, and he's come up with numerous other ways to avoid taking responsibility for Linda's death in the years since. His most recent bid for parole was denied in 2023, after he finally admitted that Linda must be dead. But once again, he refused to tell the board where her body is located. 5. Todd Allen It was completely unlike 32-year-old Todd Allen to go more than a few days without speaking to his family members. So when he went radio silent for more than a week in June of 2021, they became extremely worried that something terrible had happened to him. 
According to Todd's family, he left early in the morning to pick up a coworker on their way to his job in Wesley Chapel, Florida. He reportedly got into a disagreement with a coworker during the drive and never made it to his workplace. Later that day, Todd's car and car keys were found abandoned near his apartment. It would have been out of character for him to willfully disappear, especially because it was payday at his job. By the time his car was found, calls to his phone were going straight to voicemail. Unable to shake the sneaking suspicion that Todd wasn't okay, his family back in Indiana reported him missing. In the meantime, his loved ones began a search of their own. Answers finally came two weeks after Todd went missing, when his body was found in a wooded area a few miles from where he disappeared. Authorities concluded that there was no reason to suspect foul play, but they didn't reveal the circumstances surrounding his death to the public. 4. Jody Huisentruit In what may very well be the most baffling unsolved disappearances in Iowa history, a popular 27-year-old news anchor named Jody Huisentruit vanished from her apartment building parking lot in Mason City in June of 1995. She was scheduled to work that morning and called to let her coworkers know that she was running late. But when she failed to show up after several hours, her concerned colleagues called law enforcement to perform a welfare check. Police found several of Jody's personal belongings scattered near her red Mazda outside her apartment complex, indicating that a struggle had taken place as she walked to her car that morning. Authorities believe that Jody was abducted and killed but her body has never been found and no suspects have ever been charged. Neighbors heard screams at the time when investigators believe the kidnapping took place, and a creepy white van was seen in the parking lot that morning, but this information has never yielded any substantial leads, and a partial palm print that was found on Jody's car remains unidentified to this day. Numerous searches have been conducted over the years, and some of the country's top experts have participated in the ongoing efforts to solve the case. They've chased down every lead and thoroughly investigated each person of interest, only to turn up empty-handed every time a piece of promising information comes their way. Jody was declared legally dead in 2001, but she hasn't been forgotten. Detectives continue to hope for a break in the case that will finally lead them to answers. And the public also wants to see the case solved. A few months after the 28th anniversary of Jody's disappearance in 2023, private investigator Steve Ridge doubled the existing $25,000 reward for information leading to Jody's remains to $50,000 by offering up his own cash. Ridge has followed the case from the beginning, and he began actively investigating it in 2019. In October 2023, he revealed that Jody had a brief, very secret final fling with a man she met at a bar just 10 days before she vanished. The man had previously been cleared as a person of interest by law enforcement and willingly spoke with Ridge about his short-lived relationship with Jody. He claimed to have last seen Jody five days prior to her disappearance. Jody's secretive suitor told Ridge that he and Jody talked about how their romance might infuriate some of her many other admirers. And Ridge believes this may be exactly what happened that someone with an interest in Jody found out she was seeing someone and killed her in a fit of rage. He doesn't think she fell victim to a random predator or an opportunist who decided to target her on impulse. Even if that's not what happened, Ridge believes that someone out there has information that could break the case. He's hoping the increased reward will motivate that person to finally come forward and share what they know. 3. Darren McMichael Arlington, Texas police officer Darren McMichael was riding his motorcycle to work early one morning in September of 2023 when he was killed in a hit-and-run crash while traveling west along Interstate 20. According to the Dallas County Sheriff's Office, it appeared as though the 24-year department veteran tapped the car in front of him when traffic suddenly slowed down. He fell off his bike and was run over by a dark-colored Dodge or Chrysler SUV. 
The deadly accident was witnessed by McMichael's wife, who also works as an officer for the Arlington Police Department, and was on her way to work that morning. The driver who struck McMichael fled the scene without stopping and remains at large, despite pleas from public officials to do the right thing and turn themselves in. Detectives have appealed to the public for video footage or any other evidence that may help them identify the suspect. And there's a $15,000 reward being offered for information leading to an arrest or conviction in the case. 2. Shania Coley 24-year-old single mother Shania Coley had just stepped out of her apartment in Patterson, New Jersey, and was walking to her car to drive to her night shift as a nursing assistant in December 2017, when she was attacked and abducted in the parking lot outside her building. The actual assault wasn't captured on camera, but surveillance footage showed Shania's gray Nissan Altima leaving the parking lot. The young woman's glasses and blood were found on the pavement, indicating that she'd been injured in the attack. Five months later, a resident of an apartment complex less than a mile away noticed a foul odor coming from a white Nissan that had been sitting in the parking lot for months. The man had been parking his vehicle next to the car for quite some time, but had never picked up on the smell until that day. Upon taking a closer look at the vehicle, he noticed that flies were swarming the car, along with what appeared to be a human body in the back seat with a sheet covering it. And unfortunately, the remains were later confirmed to belong to Shania. All signs point toward foul play, but nobody has ever been arrested in connection with the young woman's murder. More than five years after the discovery of her body, Shania's family is still waiting to find out who's responsible for her death. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Daniel Gallardo In October 2015, 19-year-old Daniel Gallardo drove from his home in Barstow, California to Reno, Nevada where he stayed with his cousin for a few days while waiting to start a landscaping job in nearby Truckee. The young man left for his first scheduled day of work, but never arrived for his shift. Daniel's car was last seen at a gas station in the area, where he appeared to buy food and gas. His bank activity stopped entirely after that, except for automatic car insurance payments that continued to be deposited from his account. His family hasn't heard from him since that day and his cell phone last pinged in a remote area that he had no reason to be in. The last person to interact with Daniel was his former girlfriend, Marlon Murillo, who later told the Reno Gazette Journal that he stopped responding in the middle of a text message conversation. Murillo said that she received a call from him, but it disconnected after she heard Daniel say hello, as if the call had dropped. She found it unusual that Daniel had stopped answering her messages out of nowhere, and she became even more concerned when she noticed that his phone had been turned off. Daniel was responsible and had a strong work ethic, according to his family, who said that he'd never irresponsibly skip his shift. He had one previous brush with the law for allegedly driving under the influence and was due in court just days after he went missing. Several of the teen's belongings were found at his cousin's house in Reno where he was staying, including work clothes and his laptop, which also seemed out of character. Shortly after Daniel's disappearance, Barstow Police Detective Leo Grego described the case as suspicious, noting that the young man had no logical reason to run away from his life. Authorities in Reno and Truckee, on the other hand, noted that with no evidence of foul play, there was no reason to believe that anything bad had happened to Daniel. Several months after Daniel went missing, his car was found abandoned in a wooded area north of Truckee. If he's still alive, he'd be 27 years old today. He remains listed as a missing person in the National Missing and Unidentified Database but there have been no developments in his case in several years. 9. Joyce Mitchell In 2015, convicted murderers David Sweat and Richard Matt escaped from the high-security Clinton Correctional Facility in upstate New York. One of the most expensive manhunts in the state's history ensued, costing taxpayers around $23 million from start to finish. 
The search for the convicts ended after nearly a month, when Matt died in a shootout with police and Sweat surrendered. An investigation revealed that the fugitives received help from Joyce Mitchell, a married tailor shop instructor who worked at the prison. It was later revealed that she exchanged inappropriate favors with both men and relished in the attention they gave her. She began smuggling in tools at their request which they used to tunnel out of the facility. Mitchell was especially fond of Sweat. She was aware of him and Matt's escape plan and agreed to pick them up that night and go on the run with them. They talked about fleeing to Mexico, where Joyce envisioned herself and Sweat living happily ever after in a beachfront home. Thankfully, reality set in and Mitchell backed out of the plan. She failed to pick up the men near the manhole cover they slithered out of, leaving them on their own to survive in the wilderness. Many believe that the escape killers would have murdered Joyce when she was no longer useful to them, and that her decision not to go with them was likely life-saving. Interestingly, her colleagues at the tailor shop weren't surprised that she was involved in the plot. They'd previously reported her inappropriate conduct with Sweat and Matt, but the prison had seemed reluctant to discipline Mitchell, whose husband was a respected guard of the facility. But her willingness to grossly violate the ethics of her job landed her in prison after the escape. She was paroled in 2020 after serving two years and has since apologized profusely to the public on more than one occasion. Throughout the whole ordeal, her husband remained supportive despite her transgressions and welcomed her back into their home when she was released. 8. Aisha Gunn 27-year-old Aisha Gunn was working at a prison in Wales in 2018 when she became involved with a convicted armed robber named Karam Razak, who was serving 12 years for his crimes. Over a five-month period, the two exchanged more than 1,200 text messages and calls, including explicit photos and videos. The probationary officer also smuggled a pair of her underwear into the prison for her secret lover. Gunn's co-workers noticed that she was spending a lot of time in Razak's cell and reported their suspicion, sparking an internal investigation. A search of the couple's phones turned up all their steamy conversations, along with photos of the pair kissing and cuddling inside the prison. Investigators also found messages between the two of them, in which Gunn discussed the prison search tactics, information that inmates are not allowed to have. Even after being arrested for her misconduct, the infatuated guard remained in touch with Razak, which speaks to how deeply entangled she was in the situation. Gunn's lawyer, Peter Hunter, told the court that his client was fresh out of a breakup with her previous boyfriend and was at rock bottom when Razak came along and made her feel special. But the prison trains its employees in security awareness and corruption prevention, and the judge concluded that Gunn should have known better. He sentenced her to 12 months in prison, acknowledging that he understood she was at a low point when the relationship started, but that she exhibited selfishness on a staggering scale. 7. Irian Moore After getting romantically involved with an inmate at a state prison in Glenville, Georgia, corrections officer Irian Moore allegedly began smuggling large amounts of cash into the facility. The money was reportedly used to fund a jailhouse gang, giving them the power to bribe guards and dominate illicit trade behind bars. Moore was fired in 2021 after evidence of her criminal activities as well as her relationship with inmate Divan Waller were discovered. She was indicted on numerous criminal charges the following year, including allegations that she funneled $29,000 into the prison. The allegations describes inmate Waller as the vice president of a crime ring called the Yves Saint Laurent Squad. They're known for dealing in weapons, tobacco, drugs, jewelry, cell phones, and brand name luxury clothing. The profitable enterprise has since been linked to previous instances of violence. When a corrections officer reported the activity and made it clear that they couldn't be bribed, the group recruited hitmen to murder the guard. However, the assassins ended up going to the wrong house and wound up killing an innocent 88-year-old man. Moore wasn't the only guard to face consequences for participating in the scheme. Another young woman named Jessica Gerling was also fired after it was discovered that she was an active member of the group, known among her associates as the First Lady and the Queen. She was shot to death in a trailer park under mysterious circumstances later that year, and it remains unclear whether the murder had anything to do with her alleged criminal activity. For the time being, Moore's case is ongoing. In the meantime, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations is looking into the crime ring in hopes of shutting it down completely.
6. Inappropriate Pregnancy Federal prison guard Nancy Gonzalez began a hot and heavy affair with a convicted cop killer on death row named Rennell Wilson in 2012. For months, she stopped by herself for some late-night action while working the night shift at a detention center in New York City. Jailhouse informants reported the relationship, claiming that the couple concocted a scheme for Gonzalez to get pregnant in hopes that it would garner enough sympathy to get Wilson off death row. At the time, he faced a new sentencing hearing as part of a years-long court battle to spare his life. By the time the pair's relationship had cooled down, Gonzalez was pregnant with the criminal's baby. She admitted that Wilson was the child's father during a recorded conversation with her new boyfriend, who was also incarcerated. In her own words, she got sucked into Wilson's world. When questioned, she reportedly admitted that she deliberately got pregnant. Shortly after having the baby, Gonzalez pleaded guilty to abusing a person in custody. The child was placed in foster care after she admitted to driving drunk with him in the car. Describing the disgraced corrections officer as detached from reality, the judge appointed to her case sentenced her to serve a year in prison. Just weeks after she was arrested, another corrections officer from New York made news headlines for shockingly similar reasons. 39-year-old Tashinia Lovebrewster was reportedly six months pregnant by an inmate at a state correctional facility when she was busted for the forbidden relationship. The prisoner was relocated, she lost her job, and she faced criminal charges as a result. Unfortunately, the outcome of the case is unclear. 5. Joseph Buanvige while working as a chaplain at a federal prison in New Hampshire in 2018, 53-year-old Joseph Buanvige began accepting bribes from inmates in exchange for smuggling a variety of items into the prison, including cell phones, drugs, tobacco, and other contraband. For seven months, he took inmates' orders and dropped off their goods inside a cabinet in the prison chapel, pocketing around $12,000 from his transactions. In addition to marijuana, synthetic marijuana, and drug-soaked notebook paper, Buan Vijay delivered a large amount of suboxone, a narcotic which is typically used to treat opioid addiction. When authorities busted him, they found 111 suboxone strips in the chapel cabinet and his vehicle. The substances found on the notebook paper were determined to be dangerous synthetic cannabinoids that can cause life-threatening side effects and even death in some instances. Before his arrest, Buan Vijay had a respectable track record with no convictions and 28 years of prior military service. However, he succumbed to the temptation to make some extra money on the side and paid an immense price for it. He ended up losing his job, he gained a criminal conviction, and his reputation was ruined, leaving him unable to find work. He pleaded guilty to accepting bribes and providing contraband, and was consequently sentenced to serve 40 months in prison. 4. Elsie Hibbs 25-year-old Elsie Hibbs was working as a nurse at a prison in Wales in 2021 when an inmate began flirting with her. Shortly after they began speaking over the phone and exchanging text messages, Hibbs told the prisoner that she had reservations about talking with him because she could lose her job if she got caught. But regardless of how she felt, the man pressed her to continue their relationship and she went along with it. Hibbs would later say that she didn't report the inmate for contacting her or having a cell phone, and she didn't cut off contact because he had threatened her, making her afraid to end things. And although the couple never had inappropriate physical interactions, her superiors and the authorities took the situation seriously when they discovered what was going on. Things began to unravel in 2021, when prison officials suspected the inmate of having a relationship with a different co-worker. He was subsequently moved to another facility, where his calls were monitored due to him being a newcomer. It wasn't long before those listening to his conversations realized that they were correct in their suspicions about him being involved with a prison employee. Hibbs later quit her job and was criminally charged with misconduct in a public office. Her lawyer argued that she got in too deep and painted her out as an impressionable and vulnerable victim who was targeted by a master manipulator. However, the judge saw no excuse for her to let the situation continue, especially when she was trained on how to handle these types of encounters. In the end, Hibbs was sentenced to six months in prison, and as a result, she lost her nursing license. 3. Jailhouse Wrestling Ring In a bizarre incident that was captured on camera in 2022, 
three employees staged wrestling matches against inmates at the Fairfield County Jail in Ohio. The competition was recorded by surveillance cameras, but the incident went unnoticed until several days later, when a corrections officer who wasn't involved in the crime reported it to her supervisor. Deputy Sean Pettit was fired and corrections officer Kyle Archibald and Landon Talbot resigned after news of their impromptu wrestling match broke news headlines. Fairfield County Sheriff Alex Lape told the Lancaster Eagle Gazette that the wrestling matches were purely consensual and that this was the only time he believed something like this had ever happened. However, he punished the trio for what he described as ridiculous and unacceptable behavior. Lape made it clear that he takes his position as an elected official seriously and that he plans to live up to voters' expectations for him to manage the jail well. He also said that these types of incidents won't be tolerated. The seemingly irate sheriff further pointed out that the actions seen in the video negatively impact the reputation of all the women and men that are doing the job for the right reasons. He went on to say that in 30 years of working in law enforcement, he thought he'd seen everything. But when he saw the surveillance footage, he was absolutely shocked by the behavior of the prison employees. After interviewing the men involved, the county prosecutor declined to press criminal charges. However, the corrections officer who waited nearly a week to report the incident received a 10-day suspension. 2. Taco Bell Fiasco Two off-duty corrections officers got into a heated argument with some Taco Bell workers in Prince George's County, Maryland in 2021 when they complained about their order. Tanisha Williams and Diamond Johnson were at the drive-thru when the disagreement began. At some point during the altercation, they allegedly exited the vehicle, assaulted the employee at the window, and got back into the car in order to flee the scene. However, the women suddenly drove into a group of people standing outside the restaurant, leaving several of them injured. They then crashed through the front doors of the restaurant before backing out and leaving. Luckily, nobody was seriously injured. Authorities soon caught up with the women and charged them with assault. Following the incident, the two women were put on leave from their jobs pending the outcome of their cases. Williams pleaded guilty to felony, first-degree assault, and several other charges. She received an 18-month prison sentence followed by two years of home detention and five years of probation. Johnson was convicted of a lesser charge of disorderly conduct and, as a result, she was sentenced to 14 days in prison and was given two years of probation. 1. Joseph DeMarco during a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest in Franklin Township, New Jersey in 2020, a white corrections officer was caught on video making a mockery of the death of George Floyd. George was an unarmed black man who passed away after Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin kneeled on his neck for nine minutes. The gathering, which consisted entirely of white men, hurled insults at the activists and said that it was Floyd's own fault that he was dead, claiming that he failed to cooperate with the police. Soon after footage of the harassment went viral, one of the men in the video was identified as a corrections officer named Joseph DeMarco. The State Department of Corrections suspended him without pay and took disciplinary action to get him fired from his job. A civil service memo issued in early 2021 lists the reasons for DeMarco's termination as conduct unbecoming of a public employee and falsely taking a sick day to attend the event. After his behavior was brought to light, DeMarco tried to appeal his firing. However, it's unclear whether the matter was resolved. Would you rather be broken up with on your way to work on a day that you absolutely cannot miss, or get stuck in a traffic jam while you're supposed to be giving a presentation to an important audience? Let us know what you think in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.